Good evening, and thank you for braving the elements in order to attend what I know is going to be an exceptional event at the Charleston Literary Festival. I'd like to welcome our speakers, Patrick Redden Keith and Ruth Streeter, who both flew in to join us despite bumpy travel conditions, and also to thank the sponsors for this event, Wenda and Jay Millard, who I hope are somewhere there. <laughs> So some of you will have noticed, I hope a lot of you will, will have noticed, that amongst the themes of this year's festival, journalists digging into and bringing home the truth stands out. Whether from a COVID-stricken hospital, war zones in the Ukraine, the front lines of cybercrime, breaking news in relation to the Sandy Hook atrocity, that's the previous event, and, and this event is following in that tradition. This evening, we're fortunate to have the opportunity to listen to the internationally renowned investigative journalist and essayist, Patrick Radden Keith, in conversation with Ruth Streeter, who had an award-winning career working for CBS News. Patrick Redden Keith is a New Yorker staff writer. He's the author of the best-selling, game-changing, prize-winning Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty, as well as Say Nothing, and Murder and Memory in Northern Ireland. He's also the host of the Wind of Change podcast, which some of you may have listened to and may still be listening to. His new book, Rogues, True Stories of Grifters, Killers, Rebels and Crooks, is a compilation of some of his most celebrated articles, literary journalism at its very best. Ruth Streeter was a producer at 60 Minutes, where for more than 30 years, she covered stories on politics, law, social justice, science, and culture. Her work has been recognized with innumerable awards, including three Emmys. Ruth is a member of the board of the American Civil War Museum in Richmond. So I'm delighted to hand over to Ruth and to Patrick. I'm so glad to be talking to Patrick. And I'm going to quote you to start us off. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. You said, bad prose is everywhere and no impediment to popularity. Most readers don't mind. I wish I didn't mind, but I do. If you introduce a character by saying, Mallory was a successful chiropractor who finished top of her class at Michigan, Brilliant and beautiful, she had it all, except for the perfect guy. I'm just out. <laughs> I don't care what great twist you have in store, this is not a ride I will be taking. So after reading these words and knowing that the first thing we need to do together is to introduce rogues, true stories of grifters, killers, rebels, and crooks, I thought it behooved me to let you introduce the book to the audience oh, no. and induce them to take the ride this evening. So perhaps you could tell us a little about Rogues. Well, you're really throwing the gauntlet there, Ruth. <laughs> uh, I, I, lo I love that the, you, you, you find a quote in which I'm, I'm sounding extremely insufferable. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think they asked, they said something like, I think the question was something like, how do you feel about, you know, books that aren't particularly well written? And what, what could I do? I could only answer. Um, first of all, thank you for doing this, Ruth. Uh, thank you for the, to the festival for having me in. And thank you all for coming out despite the gale. Um, so I, I uh, my job is, I'm a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine and, and um, that's something I've wanted to do since I was a kid. Um, I, when I was in high school, started reading The New Yorker. My parents didn't always subscribe, but occasionally they had it, and you, I would pick it up at the dentist's office, and I would um, read it in the high school periodicals room. And um, I, I sort of discovered the long-form magazine article as a teenager, and I, I still think that it's to me, it's kind of the most exciting form when it comes to nonfiction, in the sense that it's longer than a newspaper article. You know, the, the pieces that I write are, they might take you 45 minutes to read. 
Um, so they're, they're, they're big, they're consuming. You can sort of slip into them and feel as though you've entered a different world, but you can finish them in a sitting. Um, I'm sure some of you uh, have New Yorker subscriptions and have that experience of the magazine kind of piling up on your bedside table <laughs> like an accusation. Um, <laughs> and uh, my aim is always to, to write the piece that you might finish. Um, but I, I grew up really loving that form and it, it took me a long time to figure out how to actually get the job doing that. Um, I went to law school, which I wouldn't recommend if you're aspiring to be a journalist. Um, it's a very expensive way to, to do it. Um, but I ended up uh, uh, publishing my first piece there in two, 2016, and or 2006, excuse me. And um, Rogues is a collection. It's a collection of 12 stories that I picked from the last 12 years or so at the magazine. And it's funny, you know, when we, when we put it out, I had just published a couple of books and I'd had a podcast and the sense was let's just collect some of the, the magazine articles because there are people who discovered my writing through my books but didn't necessarily read The New Yorker. Um, and so the idea was just pick, pick your favorite pieces. And I don't think of myself as having a beat. You know, I, I, I'm not a specialist. Part of what I like about the job is I'll spend four, five, six months working on a story and really immerse myself in it, and then I move on, and I don't look back. I move on to something totally different. Um, but I noticed as I was putting the book together that I did have certain themes that I'm interested in, and crime is one of them, corruption is one of them, uh, self-delusion. I'm really interested in the stories that we tell ourselves when we're doing bad things. Um, there's an old adage in Hollywood among screenwriters that the the villain in the movie never thinks that he's the villain in the movie. He thinks he's the hero of the movie. You know, the, the villain's watching a totally different movie than the one you are. <laughs> um, and so I'm always very attuned to those kinds of uh, questions. And there's another theme that runs through these pieces, which is, um, and maybe we can talk about this, which is what editors call the write around. So the idea here is normally a journalist, a newspaper reporter, or a magazine journalist, um, or a, a TV producer, news, news producer would, if you want to write a story about somebody, you would approach them and say, hey, can we have an interview with you? Um, and if that person says no, it's often the case that they'll just say, okay, well, I guess we won't do the story because we don't have the access. And I became really skeptical of that, uh, particularly because I think these days, really powerful people, whether they're business leaders or politicians or uh, musicians or athletes, often are surrounded by lawyers and publicists who really manage those interactions. Um, so I kind of think access is overrated. And so in about half of the stories in this, um, in this book, I'm writing about people who I never got to sit down with. So there's a big article about Chapo Guzman, the head of the Sinaloa drug cartel. Um, and I didn't get to meet with El Chapo. Uh, after the piece came out, a lawyer for El Chapo did ask me if I would ghostwrite his memoir. Um, <laughs> so there was that, but I, I, I declined that opportunity. Um, and there's another piece about a guy named Mark Burnett, who was the producer of The Apprentice, um, who really kind of found Donald Trump, who was a, 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 you know, had, uh, was a kind of familiar figure in, in New York real estate but, and in the New York tabloids, but not a big national figure in quite the same way, and, and Burnett built The Apprentice around him. And Burnett didn't want to talk about um, Trump or The Apprentice with me. He wouldn't give me an interview, but um, he had these two ex-wives uh, <laughs> <laughs> who did. Um, and that was, you know, that's a situation in which I actually think I probably learned more about the man from the interviews with the two ex-wives than I might have had I had the opportunity to sit down with, with him and his lawyer and his publicist and his publicist lawyer and, you know, uh, and on and on. Um, so there are a variety of different uh, characters here. They're not all terrible people. The final um, piece in the book is about Anthony Bourdain. Um, I had written some dark stories. I often do these quite dark stories, and um, some of which are in this book. I'd done a story about the Boston Marathon bomber and the uh, death penalty lawyer um, who actually has South Carolina connections, Judy Clark, who represented him, and I did a piece about the, the Lockerbie bombing and this guy whose brother was on the plane, and he set up for 25 years. He, he set out to try and find the person who built the bomb, and he finds him. But these are pretty 
pretty dark stories, and my editor said, what would you like to do for fun? And I said, uh, I wanna travel with Anthony Bourdain. And um, Bourdain was up for it, and so I spent a year working on that piece, which my wife thinks was technically longer than I might have needed to, <laughs> but um, I ate a lot of good meals with him. And um, of course, that story too has a sad ending because about a year after the piece came out, he took his own life. Um, so it's, it's not all uh, uh, criminals, but I think Bourdain probably would have liked the idea of being included <laughs> in a book called Rogues. Um, he had a, a somewhat roguish sensibility. So I think I'll leave it at that uh, in terms of the general introduction, but, but that's, that's the book. So why are you so captivated by the dark side, by the scoundrel, by the skullduggery, the intrigue? What's the magic for you? I, I think part of it is, I, you know, I grew up reading mystery stories. Um, and uh, I guess another aspect of my writing that maybe is worth mentioning is that I... I do what I think of as, as narrative journalism. So I'm trying to tell a story. Um, and so I like, I like plot, I like character. It's weird to talk this way when you're talking about real life. Um, all the stories are true, but I want them to unfold in the way that a really enjoyable novel would. Um, and so maybe to some extent, roguish personalities are a good engine for a story like that. Um, and my earliest reading experiences that I, that, that stay with me now was Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie, P.D. James, you know, the, the great, um, mystery writers and characters. Um, but also I don't, to go back to that, the, the, you know, the screenwriter quote about villains, I, I'm not particularly interested in cartoon villains. I don't really think cartoon villains exist, um. I mean, Elon Musk this week may be, uh, <laughs> may be a, a counterpoint to that. But, um, but I, you, uh, what I'm really interested in is the way in which people deviate from conventional morality and the stories they tell themselves while they're doing that. And sometimes, as in my book about the Sackler family, uh, you have a very wealthy family that made billions of dollars selling a drug that helped create the opioid crisis they don't think that they're bad people. They think they're just very misunderstood. Um, and then you have people like Chapo Guzman, but honestly, I don't think he thinks he's a bad person either. So for me, it's, um, you know, I, I'm not trying to kind of slam my fist on the, um, on the lectern and deliver a sermon. I'm interested in seeing these people as they see themselves and understanding, you know, how do any of us uh, stray from the kind of broad parameters of, a, of an ethical life? You also say you love secrets. And secrets are something that's hidden. It's meant to be kept hidden and unseen and unknown. They're often shameful. Why, why are you drawn to secrets? Well, I mean, I, you know, I could give you some highfalutin answer, but I think the truth is I'm like a 10-year-old kid. If you tell me there's something you know, if you tell me you got something in, in your hand behind your back, I want to know what it is. I, you know, there's a, there is a probably a, um, just an impulse there to want to find out. Um, but I am interested in um, the ways in which people suppress the truth, the ways in which they lie to themselves. Um, and it's often the case that it's not even just an individual, it's a family or it's a community. I mean, in, um, I wrote this book called Say Nothing about the troubles in Northern Ireland and it was about a murder that happened in 1972. There was a, a widowed mother of 10 in Belfast and she was taken away in front of her children by a gang at gunpoint and she disappeared. They never saw her again. And that was the kind of a mystery that started that book was what happened to this woman, Jean McConville. And I managed actually to figure it out, to figure out you know, where she died and who had killed her. Um, and the, har the hard thing about doing that is that I think that, and I think this will probably be true of people in this room, certainly true of people in my family. I mean, I, many of us would prefer that those secrets stay suppressed, stay buried. It's easier. Um, uh, there's a story in Rogues about this woman, Amy Bishop, 
um, who was a mass shooter. She was a professor at the University of Alabama. Some of you may remember 2010, she shot six of her colleagues. And it was kind of an unusual case because obviously we have mass shootings all the time uh, in this country, but um, they're very rarely women who do them. Um, and after the shooting in 2010, it emerged that when she was growing up in Massachusetts, just outside Boston, she had shot and killed her brother with a shotgun. And there was only one witness. It was their mother, Judy. So Judy walked into the kitchen. She only has two children. She sees her daughter shoot her son with a shotgun. And the cops come and Judy says, I saw the whole thing. It was an accident. And that story is about not so much Amy Bishop, the shooter who I, I'm not as interested in, but Judy Bishop and that choice. And how the community, when she said it was just an accident, the community chose to look, to look away. Um, and I think they did that because they thought it was the merciful thing to do. But what's interesting to me is, maybe if they hadn't looked away back in the 80s, you'd have people alive in Alabama who aren't. And so that, that kind of power of denial, I think, is interesting. And um, in, it, without making what I do sound too romantic, I, you know, I see part of the job of the journalist to go out there and do the spade work to excavate those secrets. And sometimes people are very unhappy about that, but, um, but I think it's important. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up that story because I understand that when you published that story and when I read that story, I was very uncomfortable with the line that you crossed in this. To me, it was a line you crossed where you were um, t you confronted them with your idea of what happened, and, and you can talk about that. Um, it's it's a it's a tough line that you have to keep always as an investigative journalist when you get involved in a story and become part of the story. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I that was one of the most uncomfortable pieces I've ever written, um, but I wouldn't change a word. You know, I think that occasionally this work takes you to places where you develop relationships with people, um, but I don't, m my loyalty is not to the people that I'm writing about, my loyalty is to the truth. And I, I, have, to, I have to behave ethically, I have to, be honest and transparent with them about what I'm doing. But I always say to people, and I said to the bishops, that is the parents of, of Amy Bishop, um, when I sit down to write, I will not be pulling any punches on your behalf. I'm not in PR, I'm not a therapist, I'm a journalist. So I need to tell the truest version of the story as I understand it. Um, and yeah, that does sometimes leave people feeling uh, as though you've transgressed. And it's especially hard when you get people like the bishops who have kind of constructed a universe of denial that, that they can live in. Um, and it's very understandable emotionally why they would do that. But I mean, I'll put it to you another way. I think the Sacklers probably feel the same way about me. The Sacklers live in a universe of denial in which they have no responsibility for the opioid crisis. They're just a good billionaire family that put out a drug that helps people. Um, and I came along and started kind of poking holes in that. Um, and again, I, I sort of see that as, as part of the job, but I, but I feel, it, and, and it often takes you to uncomfortable places, but to me the answer is always that you're very straightforward with people about what you're doing, and you make it especially clear when I sit down to write, I, I'm not your advocate. Because if I were, that's not really journalism. Yeah, how did the family react when you published the piece? Never spoke to me again. But I mean, which is, you know, I mean, it was interesting. The night before we published, we had been through fact checking, which is this process, a famous process at the New Yorker where one and sometimes two and sometimes three people who work in the fact checking department before, after I've finished an article, but before I publish it, they go through every single thing. They call everybody I called. They check every fact. They sort of assume that I'm lying about it all and making it up, and then they double check everything. Um, and, you know, in a moment in which people deride journalism and say that it's all fake news and, you know, 
uh, journalists are the enemies of the people, I, I feel it's important to emphasize. I mean, that's, it's a very resource intensive thing to do, but when you read The New Yorker, you should trust that it's been, each fact has been through that vetting process. But normally with fact checking, people get a kind of a roadmap of where the piece is going. You know, even if they haven't read it yet, they have a sense of where it's going. So they've been through fact checking. And I talked to Sam and Judy the night before it came out on Sunday night. And uh, Sam said, you know, I want you to know whatever happens tomorrow, that we're happy we told our story to you. And the next day the piece came out and they've never talked to me since. Um, but again, that's emotionally, that's hard for me, but, but I, I wouldn't do anything differently. So let's talk a little bit about your craft and how you make these stories so compelling because they are not cheap thrillers. Um, we know you care about good writing and investigative reporting is a breed unto itself with special skills and demands. So how do you find your stories? What elements do you have to have in place before you'll commit to a story? So for me, and because of what I mentioned earlier about um, how I, I like narrative, I like stories, I like characters, I, those are all things that I need uh, up front. Um, I don't start with an issue and think, you know, I wanna do a story about I don't know what, um, climate change, or um, I don't know what, verification on Twitter, or whatever, you know, whatever the issue is, um, I, I usually, what pulls me in are stories about people. And, um, and then the question for me is always sort of how would I tell this in a way that is um, interesting and surprising and seductive? Um, you know, I'm sometimes asked like who my, who the reader I have in my mind's eye is, and that's really easy for me because when, when I live in New York and I get on the subway, and often there'll be somebody reading The New Yorker. They pull it out of their bag, they've just got a few stops, it's folded over, and um, you know, it's not hypothetical. I, I've actually had the experience of getting on the subway a week when I had a piece in the magazine. And looking over somebody's shoulder as they <laughs> turn the page and start reading my piece and I feel this, this moment of excitement. And, I, and, I, and I, think, I think, God, maybe I should go and say something to them. And, um, and, then, and then they read like a paragraph and then they turn to the next article. <laughs> Um, it's mortifying, you know, um, and it, it like it all happens. It's like you know, it's like the three act structure. It all happens between between 14th Street and 42nd on the Express, um, and uh, and so that's kind of the thing I'm thinking about is, um, it, it, can I do this in a way that has a certain narrative propulsion? Because I'm not an academic. I don't take the reader's work. The, the, the reader's attention for granted. I know nobody's obliged to read any of what I do. So is it compelling enough to me, and it, are there ways in which I can kind of deal the cards out in the story where there'll be an element of, of um, surprise and suspense, and um, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll move you and pull you in. So those are all things that I'm looking for. And honestly, if, I, if I'm not able to find those, then um, I, I tend not to do the piece, unless they force me to, which they occasionally do. But. One of the ways you deal the cards out is for your characters. And as you talked about, you do these write-arounds where you don't even interview the main person. And we learn about the protagonists through the perspectives of the other characters around them, the web. Um, it's an old and tried and true method. Tolstoy and George Eliot were experts at it, and you are too. So tell me about how you get your sources, it's a seduction. I know it is, because I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it's, but it's really important to you and your story genre and how you tell your stories. So how do you, how do you go about creating that connection between your sources? Slowly, usually. I mean, I should say that one advantage I have, there may be journalists in the audience, and, the, um, and one of the great luxuries of, of um, specifically writing these pieces at The New Yorker is I have a lot of time and it takes time. You know, I mean, it's, I'm, uh, my deadlines are pretty notional usually. Um, you know, it's like, ah, get it to us in eight to 10 months. 
Um, and, and over time, you can accumulate sources. And what I like to do is just kind of dig in and everybody I talk to, I say, who else should I be talking to? And slowly, you kind of develop a map. And um, I don't, I will say that one thing that's important to me is I don't want to write about people who, if it's somebody who won't talk to me, I don't want to write about them in a way that's going to feel very remote. I don't want you to, to, you know, a bunch of the stories in here are about people I didn't sit down with. When you read the story, I don't want you to feel like you're looking at them through a telescope, like it's some distant, tiny figure and you can't make out anything about them. I want you to feel like you're in the room with them and you have a sense of how they talk and who they are and how they move through the world. And the way to do that is to, um, to just get closer and closer. And so, for instance, with the Sackler family, Initially, I didn't think I could write a book about them because they seemed so remote. I thought it would be great to have a book. I thought it was important, but I didn't think I could get close enough. And then what happened is I published this piece in The New Yorker, and the funny thing that happens when you do this is um, it's like shining the bat signal in the sky because before the piece came out, nobody knew I was working on this. But once it's out, a lot of people know, and they start reaching out to you. So what happened is I published this piece. I thought, wish I could do a Sackler book. Don't think I can get close enough. And then I got an email from this guy who said, would it interest you to know that I was Richard Sackler's college roommate? <laughs> I said, why, yes, that would interest me to know. Um, I would like to talk. And slowly, I mean, the kinds of sources I had, you know, I talked to dozens and dozens of people who worked at their company, but I talked to, um, I talked to a housekeeper who worked for the family for 30 years. You know, I mean, that's an incredibly intimate vantage point. I talked to a doorman. I talked to a yoga instructor who had been on vacation with them because this is what you do when you're a billionaire. You go on vacation and you bring your yoga instructor with you. Um, but, but you also talk to ex-wives. You're very good at that. Sure do. And lovers. Yeah, I mean, if I can, listen, anybody who, ha and I should say, I mean, I don't, you know, you build in a discount, right? I mean, and, it, and it's, and if you have somebody who, occasionally you, you encounter a source who is furiously angry at the person that you're writing about, and you have to, um, I think, calibrate everything they say in light of the anger that they feel. So it's not a situation in which I'm doing, you know, hatchet jobs where I'm finding a bunch of aggrieved people. It, in fact, to me, I mean, I'll give you a good example as that housekeeper. Um, she had been the housekeeper for Mortimer Sackler Sr. for a long time, and she had nothing but positive things to say about him. She loved him. She hated his kids, but, um, but she, she really had great affection for him, and to me that actually, you know, it enhanced her credibility. Do you ever get the uh-oh feeling around some of these sources? I mean, when you lie down with dogs, you sometimes get up with fleas, and do you ever, feel uncomfortable or worry about your own safety? Because you've talked to some pretty raunchy people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's two stories I'll tell you. Uh, the, my wife, I mentioned I went to law school. My wife did too. And she became a lawyer. And she's kind of my in-house counsel. And um, the, uh, I had, we have adjacent home offices now because we're both fully virtual at this point, and, um, but I have the printer in my office, and so sometimes she'll come in to take stuff off the printer. And I had, somebody had sent me a tip about a story about the Russian mafia and um, that they thought I should do, and so I printed out a bunch of stuff. And um, one of the things I printed out was just this, it was like a, uh, it was a threat that this Russian mafia person had sent to somebody else. So it was just a series of text messages in Cyrillic, and then a picture of a dead body that they'd sent to somebody. And I printed all this out, and I was going to look at it later, and I went out to, I went into the city to just have a bunch of meetings, and I came back that evening, and my wife was out with our kids, and, but I he came up to my office, and I saw that the papers that had been on the printer were on my desk, and that that paper was on the top, and somebody had just written no on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the, uh, on the piece of paper. So that's, that's a story I, I didn't do, uh, because my... <laughs> My in-house counsel advised me not to. No, I mean, listen, the, the, another, an example from Rogues is um, there was a guy, there's a story in the book about a guy named um, Hervé Falciani, and he worked at HSBC, the bank. He worked in the Swiss bank in Geneva. 
And one day, he walked out of the bank with a huge amount of private client data um, about clients of HSBC who were essentially not paying taxes in their own country. They lived in various countries all over the world, and they were hiding their wealth at HSBC to avoid taxes. And he ended up getting arrested, and when he was arrested, he was arrested in France. When he was arrested, he told the French authorities, listen, there's a bunch of French people on that <laughs> who owe hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes to the French state. And the French were about to lock, lock him up and throw away the key or turn him over to Switzerland, worse. Um, there's a, it's a very funny moment. And uh, instead, they brought him coffee and croissants and said, <laughs> let's, let's talk. Um, so when I heard about this story, he had been kind of mentioned to me as the Edward Snowden of Swiss banking. And that seemed like a great story. So I flew to Paris to meet with him. And we met at a, he suggested we meet, it was a little strange, the whole thing. He suggested we meet at a restaurant, a French restaurant, well, a restaurant called Hippopotamus, which is actually a chain in France. It's um, only in France. It's a steakhouse for kids. Um, so <laughs> it was like all these adorable little French children having <laughs> birthday parties and eating these tiny steak frites. And, and, and me and the Edward Snowden of Swiss banking. And, um, <laughs> And we were talking, and we, we talked for four, I interviewed him for four hours. Um, and I'd say 30 minutes into the interview, I thought, I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> this man is a compulsive liar. He's lying about everything. His story doesn't make sense. Um, and it just, you know, you know, you know, when you prod a certain kind of person, you ask these questions and you keep coming back and say, well, explain that to me again. Why did you do and that? It does that? Not add and up. it doesn't add up. <laughs> and as a reporter, I mean, it's a, it's a devastating moment because you think, God, I can't, I can't build a story around my you. My story is dying. Uh, my story's dying. And so I flew home with my tail between my legs. We killed the piece. And the idea for me was I just, he, I said, he's an unreliable narrator. You can't build a piece about, around an unreliable narrator. Eight months later, I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought, no, he's an unreliable narrator. This could be really fun. <laughs> so it turns out Hervé Falciani was just a thief. He stole the data because he wanted to sell it to other banks. And then when he got caught, he said, I'm the Edward Snowden of banking. <laughs> and it kind of worked. And so the piece, I mean, I won't give too much away, but, but I sort of leaned into the fact that he was a fabulist. Um, I was able to salvage that one. I think it worked out pretty well. But, it was great. But it's often the case, thank you. It's often the case, though, that, as you know, that you get a certain way down the road, and then you realize, I don't have confidence in this person who is a major source. I have to just pull the plug. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up is how good you are at opening paragraphs. So let me read one from your 2014 piece, The Hunt for El Chapo inside the capture of the world's most notorious drug lord. Just, just listen to the, this prose and see how he sets up. This is the first thing you're going to read in the story. Think about the skill that went into putting this together. One afternoon in December 2013, an assassin on board a KLM flight from Mexico City arrived at Amsterdam's Schiphol Airport. This was not a business trip. The killer who was 23, who was 33, liked to travel and often documented his journeys around Europe on Instagram. He wore designer clothes and a heavy silver ring in the shape of a grimacing skull. His passport was an expensive fake, which he had used successfully many times. But moments after he presented his documents to Dutch customs, he was arrested. Only after the Dutch authorities had the man in custody did they learn his real identity. Jose Rodrigo Arantiga, the chief enforcer for the biggest drug trafficking organization in history, Mexico's Sinaloa cartel. Tell me about that paragraph. Did you work days on it? Was it did it come just right out of your mouth, uh, right out of your pen? I mean, how hard is it to write those kinds of paragraphs that, as you say, make the reader want to go for the ride? Yeah, I, I, well, thank you. I mean, I, I, um, I think a lot about that. And again, it's because of that person on the subway, because you're just thinking. And because, because for any of you, right, we're all inundated by information, stories, demands on our time, 
it, it's overwhelming. I don't, you know, on my computer, I'm, I'm the person who has 82 tabs because there's these articles that seem interesting and I open them up and don't read them. And um, so I always want to kind of create a little urgency. Um, I think of it as like the top of the water slide. If I can just get you over that, that top and, and going, then, then we'll be good. In the, case, in the case of that piece, what I, what I kept thinking about was um, people think that they know Mexican drug cartel stories. They've read a bunch of them. Um, they've seen Breaking Bad. They, <laughs> they have a kind of mental image in their head of what a Mexican drug cartel story is. And so I was looking for something when I was doing my reporting that would just be a weird place to start. Because um, you, with this kind of writing, with any kind of writing, you can, you know, it's, I think of it as, uh, when I talk to young people, they, sometimes they don't know what I'm talking about, but it was like where you drop the needle on the record, right? Like where do you, where do you start the tale? And um, what I kept thinking was, I wanna find a place that is gonna be totally surprising and so when I encountered this moment where instead of starting with Chapo Guzman, we start with his enforcer, who's this young guy who likes to go on European, European vacations when he's not killing people for the Sinaloa cartel. <laughs> and um, he's in the airport in Amsterdam. It's just what a weird, and because you, what I'm thinking about is that you've got the illustration, you've got the title, the reader thinks, oh, it's an article about Mexican drug cartels, I know this story. And then within the first sentence or two, I just wanna start you way over here and then hopefully put a question in your mind, which is, how is he going to get me back to where I know the story is going? The author Elizabeth Hardwick said, the only reasons to write are desperation or revenge. <laughs> <laughs> I have True for that. you? No and way. And why, why not? No way. I mean, no. I mean, I, um, I love it. I think it's the greatest job ever. I, I, you know, and, and truly for me, it's, it's, it was what I wanted to do growing up. It took me a long, long time. I have, like, I've got a framed rejection letter from The New Yorker from 1998 on my wall at home. And my first piece came out in 2006. So that should give you a sense of um, what a battle it was to, to get to do it. Um, I love it. I mean, I think actually for me, it's the opposite problem, which is that I, because I would do it, I mean, don't tell my bosses, but like I would do it for free, you know? Um, and because there's, there's, there's very little, like I don't even think of it as work. The problem for me with a 10 year old and a 12 year old and a, and a wife who likes to hang out with me occasionally is, is actually, it's, it's more that like, w if you give me a couple hours on a Saturday afternoon where I don't have anything else going on, I'll creep upstairs to read legal documents and do research on whatever the piece I'm doing just because that seems like fun. So I don't think of that as, as either desperation or revenge. It's actually, it's, it's purely... Um, joy. It's cake. It's joy. Yeah. You shouldn't hang out with Elizabeth Hardwick. <laughs> no, I guess not. I guess not. <laughs> well, she's dead, so... I suppose that'll... <laughs> <laughs> um, you grew up in Dorchester, mm -hmm. in Boston, in a large Irish-American enclave. Your father is Irish-American. Your mother is Australian. Uh, what did you take from growing up in Dorchester that you use in your writing? A lot, actually. Um, the, for those who don't know, Dorchester is the biggest neighborhood in the city of Boston. It's in metropolitan Boston. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's very diverse. Um, it's mostly working class, but, but, but not all. Um, it's kind of working class, middle class. Um, and uh, it has that, I mean, Boston has a, has a certain quality where there's just these different worlds. There's a kind of, there's the sort of blue blood Brahmin Boston. There's like the, all the universities and all the students and then, um, uh, you know, kind of big blue collar Irish community and, and all kinds of immigrant communities, Cape Verdeans, I mean, it goes on and on. And, and the, um, I guess I think of this less true in terms of the writing. 
but in terms of reporting, one of the things I love about reporting, and I'm sure you, you have experienced this too, is that the, you never know who you're gonna meet, and one day it's a, like a former lieutenant for the Sinaloa drug cartel, and the next day it's a professor at Princeton, and the next day it's the deputy national security advisor in Washington, um, and, you ha and whoever the person is, you have to find some idiom in which you can talk to them and hopefully get them to trust you enough to tell their stories. And so I think the kind of variety of people that I grew up around um, really helped. And then the other thing is, with the, in terms of the big Irish, Irish Boston family, um, it was definitely a family of storytellers and people who loved to spin a yarn. Uh, let's go to your future. Um, about what's next. Your book, Empire of Pain, which came out in 2021, is about to come out in paperback. Um, you write these stories, you send them out into the world. Sometimes, as you already told us, people don't like what you wrote, and sometimes they love it. Um, what's changed since you, since you wrote that book, since it's still topic A? Um, so, Empire of Pain came out in 2021. The, um, a lot's changed. The, the, the Sackler family has agreed to pay $6 billion to remediate the opioid crisis, um, which you could argue that's a lot of money. I mean, $6 billion, um, in, to one way of looking at it, is a lot of money. I think it's not enough. Um, the, uh, I, I, they have an $11 billion fortune, and they've agreed to pay the $6 billion out over, if you read the fine print, over 19 years. So I called some people who invest, uh, invest the fortunes of high net worth families, and I asked what the, what's like a very conservative annualized rate of return on an $11 billion fortune, um, and they said, you know, really conservative interest and, and some very conservative investments, you're looking at like 5% of $11 billion every year. So that, that means that it's, they're gonna pay $6 billion, but they never have to touch their principal. Um, they can just pay with the returns, uh, and they'll be richer when they're done paying than they are when they started. Um, and the Sackler family, um, for those of you who don't know, they had been a very illustrious philanthropic dynasty. Their name was on all these fancy museums and galleries around the world. And all those places have taken the name down, most of them. Harvard has not taken Harvard has not, with the exception down. of Harvard. Harvard, Harvard proudly, uh, <laughs> proudly standing with the Sacklers. Um, but the Met, the Guggenheim, the Louvre, the British Museum, the National Gallery in London, and on and on and on. Um, most of them have taken it down. Um, and the opioid crisis continues to rage. I mean, it's been out of the headlines because of COVID, but uh, it actually got worse during the pandemic, uh, more than 100,000 Americans died of overdoses last year, which is about the most um, uh, in any year on record. So it's, it's, it's been pretty grim. But, um, and my book is out in paperback. What role do you feel the super elite, elite business class, of which the Sacklers were part of, what, do, what role do they play in our culture? especially right now with Elon Musk. Um, can you draw parallels between Sacklers and Elon Musk? Or what's the role of this super like, elite business class? Well, I mean, that to me, that was part of what Empire of Pain was about. It's about one family um, th th that made a huge fortune in pharmaceuticals selling OxyContin. Um, but more broadly, it's about how the billionaire class in this country get away with so much and are insulated <laughs> from the downstream consequences of their own bad decisions. Um, and I do think that they actually have something in common with Elon Musk and, and, uh, and other figures like that. I mean, the thing that I noticed with the Sacklers was that, um, and I should say none of the Sacklers spoke with me for the book. I, it, you know, There might be some hubris in writing a biography of three generations of a family, none of whom will talk to you, um, <laughs> and, and who are actively threatening to sue you the whole time that you write it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but one thing that really struck me about them is I think from the outside, I had just kind of assumed that if you were a billionaire, you'd be surrounded by people who gave you the best advice that you'd have really great advisors because you could afford them. And what surprised me 
was the degree to which the opposite is kind of true. In fact, you're surrounded by people who think that the way to keep their jobs is to reaffirm every crazy thing you say. And so I think over time that can lead to a level of um, just total delusion and disconnection from reality. So the Sacklers eventually, a few of them are hauled before Congress and they say these crazy things um, and everybody else, I think, looks at them and just thinks, you, you're nuts. How could you, how could you <laughs> even be talking this way? Um, and the reason is that when they say those things to the people who they pay, the people say, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're right. You've got the right idea. All those people are wrong, but you're, you know, <laughs> in here, we see the truth. And I think the same can be, can be said of Elon Musk. It seems clearly if, to me, if you look at what's been happening in the last few weeks, this is somebody who is, you know, he, he's got a great disadvantage, which is that he's surrounded by yes men. I'm gonna ask one more question and then we're gonna take questions from the audience. Uh, is there anyone you dream of interviewing or writing about, perhaps Vladimir Putin? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Uh, <laughs> I can I can I can already tell you what my what my my lawyer would say about that one. Um, the uh, I mean, it's interesting. I you know the funny thing about people like Putin I, is that they're not very. People often ask me what you know what would you say if you could interview the Sacklers. But the trouble is that I think a lot of these people actually aren't that reflective. They're not. They're so in denial about what they do that it wouldn't be that interesting to. Um, I wrote this book about the troubles. Uh, and the IRA say nothing. And um, one of the big figures in that book is Jerry Adams, uh, big IRA figure for a long time. And for a while, it looked like I might get an interview with Adams. And he's a terrible interview. Well, exactly. <laughs> he's Teflon. So I had there was a former IRA guy who was a big source for me who had known Adams. And I remember this funny conversation we had where he said. You know, even if you get an interview, he's not going to tell you anything. And I sort of acted, I, I was a little insulted by this, and I was just like, listen, I'm a professional journalist. I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty good at this, he's actually. He's defeated yeah. all of he's us. He's defeated the best of them. <laughs> and did you interview him? Did you have, I have did you guys do it? I haven't interviewed him, but I've <laughs> He did 60 Minutes, though, didn't he? Pardon? Did, he, he did 60 Minutes, he didn't did he, at some point? Minutes. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it was he's, terrible. It was unairable, but we, we had to air it. Yeah. He... <laughs> Well, my, my guy, Anthony, my, my IRA guy said, um, <laughs> he said, you know, the thing about Jerry is that he's had what we used to call counter-interrogation training. <laughs> and what that means is you could literally be torturing him and he wouldn't tell you <laughs> what you wanted to know. Um, so it does, uh, yeah, it does make you wonder. No, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I'm trying to think. I don't, I don't have a, a wish list really. Um, like that, and I feel like if I did, if I did have secret aspirations, I'm, I'm enough of a, you know, I'm enough of a sneaky journalist that I wouldn't tell you who they are because I'm the worried secret. you might, I'm worried you might, you might steal my ideas. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's take some questions. Um, raise your hand and wait for the mic, and stand up, and please ask questions and avoid statements. That's the advice I've been given. It's hard for me to see who's, who's asking the question. Okay, great. Hi. Oh, I, I, it's okay. I'll just stay seated. Um, thank you so much. Uh, really uh, love your writing. And um, I mean, you write like uh, almost a, a friend would be telling a story. So during the pandemic, one of the things that you did was this podcast called Winds of Change. Um, and it was spectacular and it was really fun. So did the CIA write the song? <laughs> uh, for background, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, the, the, um, I made this podcast called Wind of Change and it's about, there was a famous uh, heavy metal ballad that came out in 1990 by the German hair metal band called the Scorpions. Um, and it was all about sort of freedom sweeping across Europe and, and how change was going to happen. And it became kind of the soundtrack to the end of the Cold War, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And what the podcast is about is that about 10 years ago, um, a source of mine 
called me up with a tip, which was that that song wasn't actually written by the German hair metal band Scorpions, it was written by the CIA. Um, and so I made this eight part podcast, uh, traveling the world, interviewing rockers and spies and trying to figure out whether this could possibly be true. Um, I couldn't possibly spoil it for all of these nice people who haven't listened to the podcast. I, I, listen, I, I will say this, the, I knew from the start that that podcast was going to end in a kind of inconclusive place because if it happened, it was this top secret operation, which would be very difficult for me to conclusively prove it happened, but also very difficult for me to conclusively disprove. And one of the strange things about, part of the reason I did it as a podcast is that I think if you write, um, like if, if one of the stories in this book was a mystery story and you spend 45 minutes reading it and you get to the end and I say, and we'll never know, <laughs> um, you will get frustrated. Um, whereas with a podcast, um, of course there are still people who get frustrated, but I think for the, the vast majority of people, it's pleasurable just to kind of come with you on that journey. And I don't really know why that is. I think it's partially because a podcast is very intimate. It's like your, your voice literally in somebody's ear. I also think it's partially because <laughs> there are fewer demands on a podcast. Like people can listen to a podcast and wash the dishes or walk the dog or commute to work. Um, and so they're just much more along for the ride. But um, I'm really glad you listened though. Thank you. I had, I, it was really the most fun I've ever had uh, doing that podcast. And I was saying earlier that the one of the things that's weird for me is that was kind of a side project, but like millions and millions of people listen to it all over the world. And like, so this is a strange thing where it was that for me it was kind of a flyer, but more people listen to that podcast than will ever read anything that I do <laughs> in, my, in my day job. I, I do think in retrospect that it was a, that May 2020 was a great time to release a bingeable digital <laughs> product. Everybody's at home, high pandemic, they're sick of their spouses, you know. <laughs> They've already watched The Tiger King. You know. There you go. Jay. Oh, thank you. Uh, I have to stand up, don't I? Uh, when it comes uh, on the subject of uh, grifters encircled by yes men, would you uh, like to interview Donald Trump? <laughs> you knew that was coming. Um, I would, um, I mean, I would certainly agree with that assessment of Donald Trump. Um, and I did, there's a big piece that is basically about Trump in this book, which is about Mark Burnett. Mark Burnett in some ways was the more interesting character to me because Burnett kind of, he cast Trump in The Apprentice and he knew that Trump wasn't actually a great business star. He knew about the bankruptcies, um, but he kind of, projected him as this larger than life business leader. Um, and that to me was, was really interesting. Um, I don't know, I think, I think tr Trump is such, I, I think in terms of the, I think there's a tricky thing with Trump, which is that he's, he's so charismatic um, that whether you love him or hate him, he occupies a huge amount of all of our brains these days even now when he's out of office. And when I was at The New Yorker, I did a handful of pieces about him and his administration and then eventually, I was actually, I was in the early stages of writing a piece about Jared Kushner and I pulled the plug. I said, I don't wanna do this anymore because I felt like the, um, I didn't think I was gonna change anyone's mind. You know, that people had made up their minds, whether they loved him or hated him, hated him. and if, if, if it was a, a negative piece about Trump, which it would have been, um, there was a certain kind of New Yorker reader who was gonna say like, look, yes, you've confirmed everything that I thought, but not actually do anything about it or, you know. And if it was somebody who loved Trump, you know, on some level, they probably wouldn't be reading The New Yorker anyway. Um, <laughs> and, um, and if they did, uh, it was very unlikely that I was gonna change their minds. And, and, and I think that the thing that um, those of us in New York media and kind of liberal New York media uh, often don't acknowledge is that Trump was great for business. Subscriptions at the New Yorker went up by 30%. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a fraught thing, but I don't have any particular desire to write about Trump, I think, at this point. I kind of wish he would quietly 
leave the stage. Not counting on it, but I. I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you for saying nothing. It really was fabulous. Read like a thriller and was so informative with so much context oh, about you. the situation in Ireland as an Irish American. Um, question, um, are there other like-minded writers like yourself, living or deceased, that you admire and we should be reading as well? Oh boy, gosh. Um, there are so, so, so many. Um, you know, one of the really strange things for me about working at The New Yorker is that I, I some of my colleagues are people that I, I kind of worshipped as a, like a fanboy growing up, and, now, and then they became my colleagues and friends. Um, and so some of my colleagues, I mean, there's, um, there's a woman named Rachel Aviv, who I think is just the best, I think she's the best magazine writer today, full stop, um, who is A-V-I-V -V is her last name, and she, um, she has a book that just came out called Strangers to Ourselves, which is great, and she does wonderful pieces um, in The New Yorker. Um, the, uh, goodness, a colleague and friend of mine is David Gran, who, um, wrote a book called Killers of the Flower Moon, which some of you might have read. It's an amazing book. It's currently being made into a movie with, yeah, here, here. Um, it's being made into a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. So if you haven't heard of it yet, you will soon have heard of it. Um, directed by Martin Scorsese. Um, that's a really remarkable book and, um, and uh, well worth reading. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's just, there's any number of, um, uh, any number of people I could go on and on and on. But, um, but those two are a good place to start. Thank you. Um, two two part question. One was when you were a budding journalist, what advice changed your life, and then what advice would you offer budding journalists who are considering a field? Oh wow. That is um, yeah. So one piece of advice that I got pretty early on was to take um, take pieces apart. It's funny because fiction writers, I don't write fiction, but I but I but I. Um, <laughs> If I'm being honest, I tried. I was really bad at it, but I, I, I did fiction all through college and wrote short stories. And it's a similar sort of thing, but you, you, know, you, you, take, a, um, you take a Raymond Carver short story and you, you take it apart. You, see, you sometimes hear about writers literally retyping the work of other writers just to see the way the sentences fit together. And, and some advice that I got pretty early on was if you read a piece and it really works for you, Take it apart. Look at where it starts. Look at where the, the transitions are. Look at um, you know, how many people are interviewed. What kinds of interviews are they? Um, it's, I think of it as like, it's like a magic trick, you know, where you try and, or a recipe, where you try and sort of reverse engineer and figure out how it came together. And for me, that was great advice because it meant that I, um, I just started reading in a slightly more analytical way. Um, And in terms of advice for aspiring journalists now, you know, I mean, I think um, it, it's it's so hard because the because the circumstances have changed so much. It's the it's a very different world than it was when I was getting into it. Um, and realistically, it's 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 kind of a dying industry. I mean, I hate to say it, you know, it's it's. Um, the, there's a sort of winner-take-all situation in which some of the big newspapers are doing really well, but then local papers are really struggling. Um, there aren't that many, you know, the, uh, a lot of the magazines that used to be kind of competitors for The New Yorker have dwindled in terms of the, the kinds of resources that they'll put into the kinds of work that we're doing. Um, but I also think it's the greatest job in the world, so I, I think, um, the key for me would be just find the stuff that you love, figure out how it works, and then and then try and go and do likewise. And I do think that there will always be um, an appetite for this kind of work. Or th this is what I have to tell myself to get out of bed in the morning. Anyone else? One more? Do you have any more? Hi. Thank Hi. you for being the voice at the other end of the Audible. Um, 
I, I enjoy that, so thank you. Thank you. Um, but what can we look forward to next? I know you don't want to give too much away, but <laughs> is there something coming? Um, so the, uh, thank you for listening. So you listen to the audiobooks? Yes. Yeah. Um, that was, that was super fun for me. After doing the podcast, I kind of transitioned to, to reading my own audiobooks, and I loved that experience. Um, so I appreciate you listening. The, um, so I'm back at the New Yorker. I've got a couple of pieces in the works. Um, and eventually I'll, I'm, I'm signed on to do another big book, but I'm trying to figure out what that is. I'm sort of on the lookout. So if any of you know of any amazing untold stories. I'm, I'm not very, telling you. I'm very, you're not going to tell me. <laughs> well, you're, you're in the business. The, um, We're competitors. Uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very findable um, on, online, and you can always send me an email. The, um, the thing that I'm doing that's, that's kind of exciting um, is the book Say Nothing About the Troubles. Um, we are turning that into a 10-part dramatic series for FX, um, and I'm a producer on it and doing some writing on it, and so we are going to start shooting um, in England and Northern Ireland in March, and uh, that'll be a big chunk of 2023 for me. It's a very different business, the TV business, but um, I feel like I, I spent all this I spent much of my professional life trying to design a life where I didn't have to sit through too many meetings, and suddenly I'm constantly in meetings and wondering, why did I do this? But, the, um, but it's exciting to see it take shape and think about how to tell that story in a different medium. Well, I've prepared. I'm sure you'd rather I didn't. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm afraid it is time to wrap up. Um, I'd like to thank... Patrick and Ruth for an absolutely riveting session, a riveting conversation, and to say how much, Patrick, it was music to my ears when I heard you say, my loyalty is to the truth. Um, I think that should be the catchphrase of the festival as well, whether it's journalism, whether it's fiction, whether it's non-fiction, whether it's poetry. So thank you again, Patrick and Ruth. Um, so, so um, Patrick's now going to be whisked off to the Buxton Bookstall, um, where you'll find Rogues, you'll find uh, um, Empire of Pain, um, and other of his books. And you can, you know, continue a little conversation with him there if you didn't have a chance to ask the question. Thank you very much.